Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming after a uh, great lunch. Um, I wanted to um, start today's topic, which is, um, I slightly changed the title to Digital Curation and Digital Provenance. Um, and I wanted to start with, uh, we've been talking about objects all week. So this is an unusual object. It's an extrasolar planet. This is the, from the database of extrasolar planets. So um, if um, some of you may or may not know, in the last um, couple decades, there's been hundreds of extrasolar planets detected. Um, 20 years ago, there was only a handful. Now there's hundreds and thousands. Um, this was the first one. HD 11472B, and there's the article about it in Nature, an unseen companion of HD 11472, which is the star, a probable brown dwarf. So this is from 1989, but this is from the database on extrasolar planets. Uh, and for those of you who may not know about extrasolar planets, how they've been detected, basically it's from a very looking, observing the star and looking at very small changes in velocity of the star using something called a, a Doppler shift effect. Um, so this has been basically when they, from that they can infer that there's a planet from small changes or wobbles in the, in the, in the velocity, they can detect that there's a planet with a, um, a gravitational um, effect going on and a planet orbiting the, 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 the star. So this is, a, this is um, the first kind of proven or, or um, confirmed extrasolar planet. And what's interesting about it is I was looking into this because we, uh, we collected at the museum some of the technology that was used to kind of create this, um, th that was behind a lot of these detections. And it was a British Columbia um, physicist named Gordon Walker and his colleagues Campbell and Yang who, who developed this way of detecting the extrasolar planets using something called radial velocity. So what's interesting is um, that that was done in the early 80s and this increased the precision um, immensely for actually detecting these slight shifts in velocity. And it's an amazing apparatus. This is the prototype that was the foundation for all the um, instrumentation later on. And, and what's kind of um, significant about it, related to a bit of our theme here, is that before that, it was a lot of um, glass plates that were used for looking at changes in, in, in the cosmos. Um, but here is a digital method. So they were actually, it was a detection using digital means, recorded using digital means, and then this part of the apparatus is actually a filter through which the spectroscopic light goes, and it actually, that refined the process even more and gave them even more precision for what's called the radial velocity revolution. So the precision was incredibly precise. But back to this, uh, the first kind of um, extrasolar planet confirmation, when I looked a little more deeply into this, and this is so interesting because the astronomers have this whole database of all these uh, planetary bodies and, and, and stars and things like that, and they're all um, really interested. The database, you have its type, object type, and then you have its references going back to 1850, so how many times it's been referenced. So that one, at this time, had been referenced 106 times. The star has been obviously quite studied, 453 references. So, so the object itself is an interesting digital object. So that's why I wanted to start just as an introduction here, that of course, as a curator, I'm interested in extrasolar planets, but I can't collect an extrasolar planet. <laughs> uh, but what happens is, through the instrumentation, and kind of doing an archaeology of this phenomenon, this cultural phenomenon of extrasolar planets, I came across the digital object, which the scientists literally call an object. And it has its own qualities which are quite interesting. Um, so what's interesting about this object is actually when you dig into what this digital object is, the first one, HDE, doesn't even use the technology related to the technology that I collected for the museum. So it, when I follow this object, do the provenance of it, 
very closely, what was surprising is that the object kind of gets enveloped by the last 20 years of the narrative of extrasolar planet exploration and the radio velocity uh, revolution and the precision with this technology. Um, and yet this one surprisingly didn't use that technology. And in fact, the error margin was huge in this one, but because of its unusual um, nature, the planet was huge and had a small period around the sun that they are actually able to confirm it. The guys who developed the instrumentation that I collected throughout the 1980s studied many systems with incredible precision, unheard of precision that these guys didn't even use, and they didn't detect a thing. So it's interesting, when you follow this digital object, it's now enveloped within this narrative, but it actually had nothing to do with that narrative in the beginning. So that's kind of, I'm using that to, to show that now we're in, as a curator, I'm, I have to take seriously provenance in the digital realm. So today I'm just going to, uh, a brief outline here, I'm going to talk about the challenges with digital curation. Um, I'm going to talk about open data. How many of you have heard of um, using open data? Okay, big data people know about open data. So I'm going to talk about um, in the museum world how uh, I'm, I'm experimenting with that and how it relates to, to some wider trends in, in the sciences. Um, I'm going to talk about a few case studies where I've kind of entered into the digital realm, um, gaming and genomics. And um, then I'm going to talk about digital provenance. Uh, the reading I gave to you today is by a scientist. So it's a brief reading that appeared in Nature. It's a commentary. Um, and many of our readings have been from philosophy or history of science or from various uh, humanities perspective. This is by a scientist, but the reason why I gave it to you is because I think it represents very powerful toolkit for looking at digital provenance. Um, and as I mentioned the other day, in provenance studies, there's so many different ways of, of studying the provenance of objects. Um, and in a practical sense, I borrow from so many disciplines, um, the practical ones like Nazi um, art uh, repatriation, things like that, that this is very, it's similar that I'm borrowing from a scientist here. So that's why I assigned that reading to you. So what are the challenges with digital curation um, and I, I just wanted to talk briefly, respond to some of the challenges we've talked about related to some of the questions you guys have had related to my world um, with my talk at Roland's. Um, so Gordon was talking about dissemination to gatherings. Um, I think, you know, how do we actually respond to this challenge and how do we kind of shift in the museum world to what Gordon presented um, yesterday especially. Um, and then with, with Sundar's um, and some of your questions, uh, questioning the deepest assumptions about what objects are, I find that quite inspiring and invigorating. That's what I love about being here and listening to you guys. Um, um, Esra's um, talk about, you know, the ontology of the, of the, of the um, yesterday, about not black boxing the digital objects and actually taking them seriously. And you're going to see I'm going to be doing that in this talk. Um, and then Roland's question challenge yesterday, how has science changed in the digital age? That's a big pressing challenge for me. I have to come to grips with that question um, because I'm, I can't just collect uh, like we did in the past. I, and I think you're going to see through, through some of these case studies like that um, extrasolar planet thing that as a curator I have to start getting into strange worlds. Um, I also wanted to address um, Sundar's challenge here. What is a museum for? He asked that the other day. And um, I, well, that's a, as, as our friend um, said in the audio address, um, this is a short talk and we don't want to, I don't want to get into details here. But, um, but, I, but you know, I think one thing that always come, there's a timeless kind of uh, the motto of the Smithsonian Museum, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Um, for me, in meetings, when we're talking in the museum, that's always something that comes up and it's always something I return to and my colleagues will say, oh, there goes Dave talking about the Smithsonian again. But the increase in diffusion of knowledge is a fundamental dimension of science and that's research, collecting, but also how we share it. And that's a timeless um, aspect. I think the other thing is to answer Sundar's question is um, museums, and this addresses the word cosmopolitan this week, they broaden our experience. Okay, that's like, like traveling. You know, it like this week my experience is being broadened. I'm in a room full of people 
sharing different perspectives, my experience is being broadened. Museums are a very dense experience broadener. And now, some people might say, well, not really, and I agree with them. Museums have become, unfortunately, many of them reinforcers of traditional narratives, reinforcers of identity, reinforcers of kind of canned narratives about science, whatever. Um, and that's a problem, and I that, think that's an opportunity at the same time. So let's just keep in mind what they're really for, and I think it is related to the topic of this week, and that's cosmopolitanism and broadening experience. Um, what is a curator for? I like that question better because I work at a national museum which is a very political kind of place with agendas. I can't control anything more than the collection I curate. And I can do a lot of things, a lot of possibilities within that. Um, and so I'm constantly redefining and, re and really thinking about the deepest assumptions of what a curator is. But I don't deviate from the main idea of a curator, and that is to care for, to preserve. These are, this is an important thing. I work in the world of things and materiality, and I preserve things, I care for things, and that is a kind of a sacred duty for, for Canada that I'm given that responsibility to save things that other people might deem not important. Um, but I'm also more and more a facilitator between the sciences and the humanities and many different constituencies, um, different regions of the country, and I take that notion seriously, um, and that's a little bit of a modern curatorial role. Um, but I see myself mostly as a cultural explorer um, these days, and, and we were joking at lunch, Indiana Jones of science or medicine, um, but I really, uh, if I was gonna say, you know, who, uh, how I see myself compared to other people in history and stuff, I'm, I'm someone who's out there exploring, so I'm not an academic, I teach at the university, I do publish a bit, but I am out there in the world. I learn about the world. I have two kids right now, I hardly have time to read, but I learn about the world through interactions, through things, through the collection, and that's, a, that's what a, I see as a modern curator. Um, now the other thing is, uh, I don't know about in India, but we are in a curatorial age. Um, you now go to coffee shops where the coffee is curated, you go to a website where your music is curated. You go now to Fab India and your clothes is, are, are curated. Um, and so everyone's a curator and, and it's like, it's unbelievable. And my friends all say, oh, you're a curator because like curator is like a big deal. But what does that represent? I do see myself in that vein of this. We are in an age of total bombardment uh, of choices. And I think that's why curators have become elevated because we are now seen as selectors. We're seen as arbiters. We're seen as someone, oh, please, I don't know what to do with my coffee in the morning. There's 1,000 types of things. Um, you know, please, you're the person immersed in this world, select them for me. So I think we're kind of choice experts or something in that sense. And, and, and I don't mind that role because I am different than, say, historians of science in Canada. I'm the one out there in the field doing field work in the sciences. And so I do see things. I'm immersed in things. And, and so I don't mind playing that role. Um, uh, now, related to the challenges of digital curation, where do we collect? So I am doing some collecting more online now, but I, when, I do, when I am collecting, I'm asking different questions now, like the software, the coding. You know, I have to ask different questions than just the material realm. Um, what do we collect? Major implications there, of course. Um, preservation issues, I'm gonna get into that with the, with the work I've been doing on um, gaming. Um, how do we preserve software? How do we preserve things in the digital era? It's, it's just not simple. Um, and it's quite complex uh, in very practical sense. Um, and we're, we're trying to start a whole program of digital preservation at our museum. The best museum dealing with this right now is in Mountain View, California, the Computer History Museum. They're doing really cutting edge um, preservation at digital, um, in case you're interested. Um, and then we're gonna get into digital provenance. So one of the biggest challenges right now um, is, uh, is in this digital world, tracing things. And that's why I gave you that digital provenance reading. It is really difficult. And there's all kinds of obstacles and challenges related to proprietary, but just 
dark data, things that are out there and, and, and tracing things and, and actually researching. It's very um, challenging. Um, and, then, and then another major challenge is just, it seems easy in the digital era, we can just post things on Facebook or whatever, but sharing is a very complex thing, it's not trivial, and I'm going to get into that um, and how to do it. I wanted to talk about uh, one aspect of digital curating, and that is um, open data that I've been experimenting with and we've been experimenting with at the museum. Um, this is an interesting, um, okay, so this is an interesting challenge um, that I wanted to kind of present. Uh, that goes back to the beginning of my career as a curator. And that is, in the beginning, in the late 90s when I started doing this, um, it was just exciting to share on the internet. And that quickly became part of my, um, just part of my role, or, or part of my experience as a curator. Um, and I was very early one of the first person to put stuff online. And so I always had this idea, it was very exciting to share. We have these spaces with collections and get it out there across the world and just, you know, uh, get people to interact with it. And it's, it, the, it's just that basic sharing of the collection, which we've now been doing for two decades. Um, now there's problems within sharing, um, the sharing culture that, that you're putting things online and there is something to be said about the real thing. Visiting a museum, seeing the artifact, the actual sensory experience of that and the space. Um, but that doesn't negate that digital sharing and digital experience of artifact is very different. Yes, you're not in space and it's not a sensory experience, but it is a different comparable experience and you're interacting with the artifacts in a different way and you're learning things in a different way. So that's actually um, interesting. But back to the kind of sharing model, um, at the museum, it was obvious to me that my previous museums that we should just put the whole collection online. It's great for teaching. It's great for the public. It's great for people who can't come to your museum. And, but at a big national museum, it's kind of hard to implement that. Uh, museums around the world are having this, how do you put the whole collection online? Um, and at my museum, there was a lot of resistance from um, technical perspective. Oh, well, it's going to be too impossible. We have this database, and how do we make an interface for it? And, and it's going to take years, and these resources, da, da, da. Then there were people who were very worried about the kind of information that was on it and the quality of information. Well, we should clean up all the data first because we can't share bad data with the public. And my impression of that was, the great thing about history is that it's always wrong. So we should put flawed data on the internet. And even if it looks stylistically bad, everything was written in capitals. So there was people like, we can't put it all on there, it's all written in capitals. And So there's this kind of, um, a lot of resistance but our new CEO came in and he did something really interesting. He said, okay, I see all these problems. Let's just dump the raw data online, which is an amazing thing. And I'd never even heard of open data um, uh, until a year ago. And, and so he said this, and, and what he was doing was he was part of this whole open data movement within government where the scientists, everyone was just putting raw data online. And raw data is an amazing thing. Cause so I went to this raw data, open data, meet up or speed dating thing and everyone was a digital curator and I introduced myself as a real curator in a digital curating <laughs> so all these government organizations all these um, all, a lot of people from industry a lot of scientists were putting all this open data um, and what really is interesting about the potential in open data is that you put the raw data out there and then the world hacks it they build apps they do interfaces they mine it for strange things like I'm into aluminum, so I'm going to go through all the data bases in Canada about related to aluminum. And so there's this beautiful anarchistic element to open data. And what I liked about it is that we got everything out there. And within weeks, someone hacked it and built a collection interface. So now we have our collection online <laughs> with a nice interface. With, so there's now two interfaces, and they're competing. I mean, it, it's just hilarious after all these years. Um, so. Oh, and there's an example of the raw data, which I don't understand. Um, so my first experimentation with this myself is every year at the university, I do a seminar which is collection-based. I get students into the collection, and we just work with artifacts, and it's great. And then I have them um, post things online and do all kinds of stuff. And, and um, anyway, the, the great thing about it is that they're tired of all the seminar readings. I tell them that we're not going to do a lot of readings, but I am going to put time, 
you know, I'm going to put some big time effort on, on it in the sense that I want them out there digging up um, all kinds of information and archival information related to the collection. And they love it and they're getting their hands dirty. Um, this year, as I mentioned the other day, I took as the collection those survey markers from across Canada because I thought this would be fun as a collective effort that all of the students do different markers from different parts of the country and we see what happens. And this was the website we created based on it. Um, but what was really good is that we used open data into this um, website called Open uh, Omika, which is an open source website for building a platform. Um, and what was interesting is when we used the open data, the class, I've never done this before, we always just use the internet as a kind of crude sharing mechanism. But once we, just for getting things out there, but once we use the open data, we actually had to import it and manage it. And I'd never done that before. It had always been a sharing kind of idea. So we, were, we brought the open data in, we had to clean it up, put it into the content management. And so the students were kind of um, doing data entry um, and very quickly they got into complex content management classification issues. We had a whole class about a debate about the nature of an item. And we hadn't got into those, never got into those issues before. So these are like classification content management type issues. And in that, so this spring, I was going through kind of a revolution in my set. I started seeing the data and the data about the objects as entities in itself, that they were learning about the world from these, these things and, and, and how they were organized and, and managed. Um, and, and some of these confusion was type confusion, but the type confusion had big implications on intellectual property because they were borrowing images from various museums. Um, but it also had implications for how it was interfacing on our site and how we were going to present it. Um, so they were all suddenly doing some really interesting content management. Um, and it also fed back to how our raw data was organized. So now because of that experience, we're actually, um, we redid how we dump our raw data into the open data portal. Because at first I was seeing the open data as just raw, but there's different kinds of raw. And so now we've already refined that, that data set and it's going to be more improved from the students' interactions. So I think, in summary, the, cur the curating the data objects on their own terms, and this led to massive implications for interpretation, public access, and, um, and we were not just sharing, um, using it as a sharing medium, but it was more of a curatorial medium. Now we were, I, I had always heard this digital curating phrase, and I thought, well, that's ridiculous, but we were digitally curating. We were curating in this realm. And I think this had, this is where I started getting interested in digital provenance and di the digital realm on its own terms. So I had my own kind of personal um, epiphany in that sense. We're, we'll get into that later. Oh, this was, um, this is just some of the, see, we were interacting with the survey markers. We went to the surveyor general office with the actual records and the maps. So there was all kinds of diversity of materials we were, and, and th this was all kind of being this whole diverse set of evidence and materials. Um, we, were, we were managing that in the, on, the, on the website with our open data. So it was a real mix match. They really developed some pretty powerful skills. And then we mapped, um, all the objects are mapped on a cool little um, uh, interactive map. And here is some of the, um, this is the back end of the website when you actually enter the data. And all these categories are very problematic. It's like very, when uh, this is the class discussions, you, you're, you suddenly have to fit into a specific kind of suit for the data and that's where we had lots of discussions. Um, so let's go to another case study here. Um, uh, our new CEO was really interested in gaming. <laughs> And uh, I know um, Mira is interested in gaming. Okay, okay. And personally, I'm not a gamer. I don't know anything about it, but I was um, part of the team for doing things. So I just thought, well, I'm going to get involved in this at the level I'm interested in. And, um, and I visited some, some of the gaming kind of studios in Montreal. Um, and one of them was uh, Warner Brothers, um, um, which I'm going to talk about this image in a few minutes. Um, but the, our, our exhibit on this is quite interesting. So they're actually, 
the exhibit's going to be about the elements of gaming like sound, graphics, um, coding, consoles, storytelling, um, the platforms. But all these different elements are going to be broken down and separated in the exhibit and, and kind of to, to show in a critical way, you know, what the nature of games are. And I, and, I, and I love, like, the idea of, like, story or sound. Well, how do you collect that? How do you collect story? These games all have two or three writers, um, and then they have sound guys. And, you know, it's quite, a, quite an interesting thing. But when you visit the studio, it's, it's an amazing immersion in a very interesting culture. So there's hundreds and hundreds of like punk kids there testing and they're paid a lot of money. They're sitting there just testing the games and they got like energy drinks um, at their thing. And so, so that's, an, and then there's the ping pong tables and all the kind of Silicon Valley um, nonsense and kegs for keg parties and stuff. But, um, but what, what immediately one of the challenges that interested me is um, I thought, okay, how am I going to deal with this in a practical sense for the exhibit? And looking at some of the games for the first time, because I'm not a gamer, I, th I became fascinated by the iconic scenes. So with, with the Batman game at Warner Brothers, one of the iconic scenes is a boss fight. It's called a boss fight. And a lot of interesting things goes, in, goes into that. The graphics guys are actually, they're doing some acting with these, you know, suits with, um, you know, so there's actually a very physical dimension. And it's all towards building authenticity, which is so um, fascinating, the kind of physical and, and, and trying to replicate it and create an authentic, seamless um, environment. Um, but what, what, so when I'm doing the archaeology of it, I ask questions that they don't expect. Um, and one of them was like the graffiti. It turned out that a lot of the references in here are based on photographic recording of Montreal, where the studio is. And in fact, that is a renowned graffiti artist, Saki, in, in Montreal. Um, and so he's like a major celebrity in the graffiti world, and, and, they, and he, his work is in the game. Um, and so there's a lot of blogs about him being in the game. It's like props to you, dude. You're now big time. <laughs> and then there's people who are who are um, who are criticizing it. And then there's deeper questions about proprietary issues. Well, did they pay him? Well, in a way they had to have paid him, but in a way they couldn't have paid him because he's an anonymous person. If you pay him, that's in the tax records of Canada, and then they could arrest him because he's. He's caused millions of dollars of damage. Not, the graffiti people would not say damage. They would say beautiful artwork, but the police would say this guy has caused millions of dollars of damage. Um, and so, so it's interesting, again, I'm doing, so an archeology span of this, how do you actually physically do this? Well, I had to have a whole meeting with one of the producers and we went a step by step, how do we do it? How will we do this? Go through the process. But in the end, it was like amazing that a huge multi-billion dollar company doesn't really manage their records because it's like, well, that was six months ago. I don't know where that stuff would be. You know, wh okay, where would the photos that you took of the city, of the bricks and of the corners and of the buildings and of the graffiti, well, okay, we might have to dig through our, um, through the, all the, 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 um, the hard drives and stuff and we could find it, but you think, you know, but of course it's not really organized. So there's, that, that's like, you know, I would like to be an archaeologist where I go to Egypt and do real digging with a shovel. But unfortunately, my job is I have to go to a studio with kids playing ping pong and say, okay, let's go to this hard drive this morning and, and go through it and look for it. That's what an archaeologist is now, right? <laughs> um, anyway, about um, Saki, um, here's something I pulled from the internet for you guys. Um, this is just amazing, the kind of discussions about this one guy, one element of the game. Got to start in 94, but the city's biggest name by 97. Like Casco is perhaps among the least artistic writers included in this article. Although he produces the occasional colorful piece, he specializes in tags, throw ups, and straight letters, which the public tend to see as lower forms of graffiti. But he continues to bomb consistently and often paints with big names from other cities across North America. And go YouTube this guy, and he's like, there's these hilarious YouTubes that aren't much different than like ISIS videos or something. It's like this corny music in the background and their, their faces are kind of blotched out and they're like doing these things with hoods on. It's like, oh my gosh. So um, it's kind of fun to, to research that. So let's go to one more um, challenge uh, here. 
Uh, this is a synthetic cornea. Okay, so um, cornea have been transplanted into humans for, I don't know, hundreds of years. Um, but recently now using um, genetics, they're actually producing a certain type of what's called the collagen, the protein for cornea that can do very specific things. Um, in this case, this one actually is implanted, it dissolves and then the real tissue grows in around it. So it's quite a fascinating, um, uh, it's called biomimetic um, synthetic uh, cornea. And, uh, and so um, it was a local um, development and I just thought that's an interesting curatorial challenge. You know, and we're having a lot of these types of things. It's kind of not accessible. It's not something you display in the museum. This is in fact how it was displayed in the museum. Um, one of our conservation people put some, um, you know, um, some uh, violet light on it so you could, you could actually see it. But then we built up around it a whole kind of context of, of not the history of it and how it worked, but more of reflective of the curatorial challenge. And I thought sharing that is part of the story here. And, and that's kind of the, you know, sometimes it's good just to share what, we, what we're doing and I think people um, would be interested in it. So it's, it's, a, it's got really complex elements um, uh, to its structure. It is a collagen. It's, um, it's based on recombinant DNA technology. And I think within that, there's some interesting, talking to the people in the lab, there's um, you know, a lot of the kind of code they get from that are swapped on the internet. So this is just like uh, from databases. Um, and, and, then, and then there's also the donor sources of actual, you know, the genetic people in here would, would be able to comment further on this, but, but there's actual physical, some of this comes from physical places. Uh, and then some of it is just kind of swapped in the digital realm. Um, so this is um, tissue engineering, synthetic engineering. It, uh, what I liked as a, his, as a historian of scientific instruments who looks at telescopes, things like that, it was very similar, the process of making this cornea, which I studied, to making, uh, to lens grinding, going back 400 years for uh, a telescope. But the materials were much more complex. So it's not a straight lens grinding um, thing. Um, in order to document it, um, we had um, uh, uh, artists in residence for four months a few years ago, Bob Bean, um, and he's essentially a photographer. Um, Roland actually introduced us, um, and he was part of the Halifax, um, uh, he's from the Nova Scotia Academy of Art and Design. And he, you know, he is one of these powerful artists through which I love seeing the world. I learned new things about our collection from him, and when we went to visit spaces like this, I saw it in a different way. So he I, he, I brought him along, I did some sound recording, I interviewed her, and Bob did these, um, these photographs of, of the lab process which were in the exhibit. So these are actually the, the molds. These are plastic um, molds in which the, the, um, the, um, the collagen is put. And so it was this dark art to the point where some of the things she showed me um, she had little ingredients and, and how the process was proprietary. So one of the things she actually gave me, I, she had to take back. Measurement. It's a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful, it was great in the exhibit, some of these um, photographs. Okay, so um, after seeing this process, part of that process, again, this is the kind of curating Gonzo curating, going out in, in there with an artist, um, it, you, it generates questions. Um, and going and looking at the technical paper, there's some interesting things that you see. So the collagen is from a company called Fibrogen, okay? And that's very interesting. Um, and then the um, part of the ingredients comes from funny companies called Nippon, Nippon uh, Meat Packers in Tokyo. Collagen from big staples. Yeah. So, um, so this is where it gets, this is where um, not as much digital curating, but just contemporary recent science curating, the, the challenges of it, um, and where you hit an accessibility wall. Once you get into this company here, you get into modern genomics collecting, and a lot of it is proprietary there's a wall and you do not know the sources and it's not traceable the sources and where things have come from. And 
it, you know, for example, just where they've got their information. Um, and you, so it can't be sourced past the point. And in fact, they even say here, this is from their website, they're even proud in the sense of um, it has a strong proprietary position. So there, they're, you know, this is this is part of their this is part of the intellectual property of, of the whole genomic uh, industry. And then I love um, I love curating in the sense that you find these <laughs> wacky connections to you know this meat company and you know this is part of the ingredients of and this is. This is, again, as a curator of a science museum, this is what you want to present to people about science. That these people went to, they ordered some of their stuff from this crazy company. You know, you're getting your surgical implant today. Do you know that some of it comes from Nippon Ham in Tokyo? So, um, okay, so now there's kind of uh, going into the, the last part here of digital provenance and how I kind of got interested in I've given you a flavor of, of digital provenance, but um, part of this came from these questions developed during the course of digital entities on their own terms. And, and some of these challenges within collecting of tracing digital entities on their own terms. And that this, so I suddenly saw that this was an important field in itself and amazingly discovered that of course, there's a whole group of people doing digital provenance. Um, why really is digital provenance important? For a few reasons, it's just very high stakes. There's a lot of money out there, there's a lot of information, and you've gotta be able to trace those things for, for very specific um, high stakes reasons. Um, the reason I learned about it through this Marshall Ma, whose reading you have there, um, is I was at this international conference of scientists and Marshall is one of the leading people in digital provenance in the world and he is researching it through a specific context of open data for scientists. So this is really interesting that, that there's, a, there's a whole culture in the sciences of like we're talking about here, cosmopolitanism and, and we want to be able to share and have data accessible. Um, like in the article that I gave you, you know, he wants accountability, traceability, and when claims are made about sea level um, rise, sea level levels, um, he wants to be able, and connected to very big debates like climate change, he wants to be able to have that data um, accessible and traceable, but not only that, probable for connections to, he, he's doing it at, at a much deeper level, like how can we, get the tip of the iceberg here, this data, and have all the social connections, the institutional connections, the entity connections, right down to, when I discussed this with them, collections. A lot of their stuff is based on data, and a lot of that data are specimens. A lot of the data are things like the exoplanet, but a lot of them are geological specimens. A lot of them are frozen genome, um, gene bank specimens, but the world is data and, and, and they're interested in having that accessible. So it's kind of a, a, a clash of, of private and public interested in science and, and these guys are at the top level and they're, they're redefining and, and really shaping and creating tools for digital provenance. And so that's the practical thing, but I just love it, the tools. As a curator, I'm saying, okay, this guy's showing me how to take a digital object and find out it's all these wonderful connections below the tip of the iceberg. That's amazing. So for me, now being pushed into the digital a digital um, curating to see these connections, um, this is a very powerful tool. And then within, you can go to this website, by the way, it's quite amazing, um, quite understandable in a sense, but it's, so they even have this um, prov, oh, prov ontology. And there's the definition of provontology. So we've had lots of this guy. I love these words that I'm throwing at you from the scientists today. These are people who use the word object. We've been using it all the way week in a different sense, ontology. So, okay, in conclusion, for what I wanted to say today, um, so the first level of digital curating, new ways of making collections accessible. That's really important. I think that's really changing what museums are doing, what curators are doing. Um, but more importantly, taking seriously the nature of the digital medium, uh, not just as a broadcaster, 
but as a unique realm and means for creative curation. Um, and that's really, I think, where I'm kind of discovering interesting um, elements of this. Um, facing the challenges of curating science as it become, um, becomes immersed in the digital um, culture, problems um, become opportunities. So I think that the provenance problem within the digital open data is an opportunity for actually probing deeper what the nature of science is right now. Um, and, and I think prov digital provenance is a very powerful tool for probing science in new ways. Um, and I'll end it there and, and open it up to discussion. Thanks. Sundar Sarkar's question of what is a museum, and you said that what does a museum do? And you said it's broadening of knowledge and dissemination of information. But uh, I think all of us are sort of aware that there are museums and then there are museums. And uh, the national museums in all countries, they are a nationalist project informed by the power knowledge access. And uh, we could see science museums as uh, a different sort of museum. But I'm also wondering that uh, perhaps in the National Science Museum, something uh, that is very common in our world today and uh, has been possible because of the new frontiers that science has covered, like say in vitro fertilization, assisted reproductive technologies, that would probably not find space in the National Museum in India because, or a part of this narrative, say, uh, the possibility of having uh, gay or lesbian families, that sort of narrative would not find space in the National Museum, National Science Museum. So it's not just about broadening knowledge and disseminating certain narr narratives, but certain narratives broadening certain sort of knowledges. So yeah, and I have another question relating to the idea of objects that find space in the museum. Uh, it was probably uh, what we understood, what objects made it to the museum was sort of related to the idea of the obsolete. And uh, in, uh, when you're uh, curating digital objects and then uh, that are entering the space of the museum, uh, how do you relate it to the idea of the obsolete, which was, yeah, primarily whatever. Okay, there's two big ideas there. Um, let's just talk about national museums first. Um, well, I agree there's things we can't um, discuss in the National Museum because it's just geared towards nationalism and, and their political environments. So, but even in the science museum, something like the IDF, yeah. a certain part of its narrative would not find resonance. Oh, I agree. And that's, so it that's is cool. also a political project. If not, what I do not agree to this whole sanitized idea of uh, the science museum that it is only about broadening knowledge. Yeah. It is not just about that. There is a bigger. It is always it is structured in a society, and so there is. It is also a political project in itself. Now, first of all, I wouldn't say broad knowledge. I think a small part of museums are education, mm -hmm. very small, and it's not very very effective. Um, I do think the contemporary art model is a little better, that it's broadening experience. That's a little bit different, broadening experience. But in terms of um, what you're saying, I agree. It's like it's in many museums, you just can't deal with certain topics. Um, and that's why I like the second question better, what is a curator for? Because one of the roles I didn't put there that I see myself across the country is encouraging, facilitating, and helping the small cutting edge um, uh, activities, um, galleries, um, small collections, university campuses, to do those experimental things, to do, those, to, to, to do um, take on topics that we don't do in a museum. I kind of, we, we, I, just, I think the big dinosaurs can't do that. Uh, I, and in fact, like it's amazing where I was talking lunch with someone, we could probably never, I mean, the biggest thing in the last you know, 40 years, in the 20th century, third, um, in the last 40 years, we've had AIDS and HIV. Um, and to have a big, um, you know, the history of medicine, uh, history of Western society, especially, you know, here too, I mean, but we can never do something like that. And, and you know, um, it's amazing how it's still stigmatized as a topic. Um, but 
my role as a curator is to, and, and as a national curator, I'm getting out there and trying to encourage people to deal with these topics. The other thing I encourage people like yourself who might be disappointed with a national museum is to come and hack our museum. Use our database, create your own narratives, um, come and critique an exhibit. And we have very like uh, you know conservative messages. Um, and I take my students, we had an energy exhibit, which was um, a very kind of, um, it was like something about the power to choose, and it was social engineering in a sense, like, um, uh, you know, it was just kind of an education message about energy. But the artifacts were beautifully curated, a great selection, and I get my students to come in there and anarchistically, you create the narrative. Um, and, and so that's, that's actually where national museums are the best. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that's out there and a lot of really big, boring exhibits and like hack them. Because um, the, even the best exhibits are a form of a lie. All of them are. So one of my friends who's, who does heads the students write papers, he says, go in and do a critique of an exhibit and, um, and instead of saying the curatorial voice or the museum says, just say the lie. The li there are labels, don't say the labels say, the, the lies say, you know, and it's a fun little kind of, um, so anyway, what your question? Not you yet, not you yet, I want to know the students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not being put online, is it? Because <laughs> I'm speaking truly. It's not being put online. You are, you are not being put online. Yeah. Um, yeah, just coming from where she is, and uh, it's we also, I think, uh, we talked about this, uh, uh, whatever you know, like the, the uh, scientific objects, and thank you for like showing us you know, in the last few days. I've also been learning a lot about the curatorial aspect and what a museum is for. And uh, one thing I've learned is like uh, you know, very like so many. Um, for example, just to give an example, would we ever have like a museum which is scientific, but which are showing like the objects uh, who have done a lot of damage? You know, that like, done a lot of damage. Yeah. Like the when you show the first aeroplane that the Wright brothers made and all of that, so that's a or you show the first connection between telegraphs between the two countries and all. Yeah. And will you show the atomic bomb or the bomb that you're throwing all over Vietnam and Iraq? You know, there are those are also scientific objects. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it is not to say that it is your task to do it. But I'm just uh, interested in the fact that. At the same time that science, you look at science and what you call about this narrative right now, the narrative is always a positive narrative. Yeah. You know, in a way, that it's grinded into your mind that what, no matter what happens, you know, like eugenics, for example, will, forget about Germany, will America own up to its own eugenic past or will us, you know, Indians, just whatever we call us Indians, will we owe up to our own past and say that our technology has always been used in a different way. But we can do it for the past. Like, For example, we can show that in the past, people used to kill each other with knives, and the Vikings invaded, or the Mughals invaded. But for our own times, sometimes it's like, like you know, it's a blackboard kind of thing. So I just wanted to bring that up. Well, yeah, there's a few dimensions to what you're saying. Like, um, but about, the, about those things like, uh, you know, like, uh, for example, depleted uranium, which is all over yeah. the soil in Iraq right now, and, and, and you can trace some of that depleted uranium to Canada. Even coding. Pardon? Coding coding. Yeah, how coding is intrinsically not only about creating video games or applications. It is about, look at North Korea hacking <laughs> US and all of that. So that part, where is it? You know, it's not. <laughs> I love what you're saying. Uh, like I said, I, uh, I don't want to see like uh, I've given up, mm -hmm. but we usually, um, I address that through, again, like I said to you, I, I address that through encouraging people to um, comment on our stuff, create platforms for it, and do it in, and do it in other experimental spaces. And, and, and I don't just say that, I do it. I really am out there across the country trying to help people. Um, and thanks to a lot of what Gordon's done actually um, in organizing a network across the country, and he's really brought us in and 
integrated us into the um, network across the country, which has given us a great way to do that, to help encourage um, um, this type of activity. Uh, but I think that it's really important to, to expand the role of the curator to be doing that. Um, that's quite important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add to that, and all right, on a national level, definitely there's a lot that is not necessarily museumized, but one of our friends referred to a war memorial in Vietnam earlier, right? So, I was also thinking with narratives of suffering and wars, there are, there's a lot of museumization of suffering itself as well, through theorization as well as, let's just take the Holocaust for instance, a cultural memory is kept alive through musicalization as well. It's not not necessarily on a national level, but there is the entire historicization, which is especially as the generation of Holocaust survivors are coming to a close now. There's the aggressive musicalization taking place across the world. Right? So there's that aspect of it as well. Yeah, that's, uh, and I think that relates a bit. No, no, I'm kind of going on a tangent on your but everyone you wants to start a museum now. So at the at a, at a kind of state level, at the local level, the, the funders are all getting, I want to start a museum. I've got um, uh, 5,000 um, cans of evaporated milk and from the last 50 years, I want to start an evaporated milk museum. And so, but everyone's trying to embalm their, their experiences and preserve them um, Forever, there's a there's an immortality dimension to museums, which is uh, which is big, and the, and the suffering is deeply connected to that. That you want to preserve that in some way, and it's it's, it's yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to know how do you collect in uh, how do you collect digital objects? Because I'm not very familiar with a lot of things. Uh, so uh, well. Um, how? We're, we're what figuring, is the change in yeah. how? We're, well, we, we actually haven't figured that out. We're, we're developing a, a policy as we speak, and a few people are helping at Palo Alto and Mountain View, and we have a computer historian in, in Toronto. Um, but then there's a lot of debates. Um, there's a lot of technical people at my work who have jobs um, in IT and stuff, and they have very strong opinions on that. When you save software, you just save the code, you save the material dimension of it. Um, like there's a, those, so it's actually not um, an, an easy thing, um, and then there's uh, proprietary issues with with all that too, because you're saving all these things, and then there's someone out there who knows that in 50 years it's going to be very hard to access all this stuff, and if they figure out a way to to, to on a proprietary turn that into a business, they're going to be multi multi trillionaires. Um, but so so. Um, like with the gaming thing, we're just going to be collecting snippets, and and then we have to get in this massive amount of intellectual property. Um, but but say that that object that I, I can't collect that digital object that I started with the extrasolar planet, that is impossible to collect because as an object, it has accumulated over 20 years. Um, uh, massive amounts of proprietary boundaries. So if I took, let's just say, all the data related to that extrasolar planet, 30% of it maybe is owned by Taylor Francis in their journals. So if I took that 30% out, it actually changes the nature of the object in terms of preservation. So that object is a constellation of proprietary, um, that's very, I could not collect it. Uh, relating it to the copy of article that we read, um, a museum object becomes a museum object at a certain part of its biography. It's yeah. it's life. So, at what point does a digital object become part of a legitimate uh, object in the museum? At what part? What well, phase of its biography? In terms of that one, when we actually collect it, or or those sequences we collect from um, from Warner Brothers, when we actually collect it and catalog it. So it's as simple as this. we own it then. Yep. No, just to add to your point that everybody wants to become a, you know, start a museum to be there are very interesting blogs online, you know, which, uh, 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 like, going back to my work, 
They are very interesting graph which shows these photographs from colonial times in Kerala and these photographs are not available because they have, you know, uh, MS has uh, collected these photographs from some personal collections and these are very interestingly curated and they all have these stories when this photograph was taken, who was and how these people were, you know, made to sit in a particular pattern and all, all these things. So, I think that's the possibility of a curatorial, curatorial age also that you don't have always to look at the national museum for you know the museum or the past or the memories or or these and there are all these possibilities of a digital age also. Yeah, and well, as long as, you know, I, I just encourage people that not everyone has to have a museum. You can have collections, uh, right? And and you can um, and, and just as long as you care for them properly, and, you know. But that's, you can do most creative things with collections, not a museum. Uh, you're absolutely right to take questions mostly from the students and I'm not going to comment on the other hand. I just want to give them some information uh, about digital objects. The big project, which is actually a private, public uh, sort of NGO, the archive.org, <coughs> has associated with it the Wayback Machine, which is trying to have a digital record of everything that's going on on the web since the beginning of the web. And that's a remarkable achievement, right, to do something like that. And it has cooperation for many of the uh, stage organizations and libraries. Uh, and, that, and, and that I see that your museums will have to metamorphosize into that yeah. eventually, insofar as uh, you cannot continue to collect, as you said yesterday or the day before, the amount of stuff is just going to be increasing, increasing, and you're going to have to go digital with the, the, the stuff that you're collecting. And associated with this new form of curation, which will be that associated with the digital imagery and maybe three-dimensional digital imagery and other things that come up that archive.org will be in charge of. As of, uh, as of new museums that, and archives that are coming into existence that address some of the questions that we just heard, uh, there is a fantastic project that is now in its fifth year in Canada and it's called the Living Archives of Eugenics. And it was a well-funded project to try to uh, interview everybody that's alive that was still involved with uh, eugenics, including the survivors of sterilization programs and, and things like that. And that's a really interesting model of getting beyond the museum as a site uh, and, and an archive to uh, making those that are living part of their uh, creation of their own heritage was to suffer under the uh, eugenics regime. And the third one on national museums, uh, some national museums are, are, are not national museums in the way that we think of them uh, talking about their own national states. The British Museum, for example, uh, in an interesting gesture a few years ago, created a special room where the old library was, and, it, and it's the, um, the ex exhibition of the enlightenment, right? I don't know if you've ever seen that thing, but it is quite a striking exhibit that uh, is all about cosmopolitanism and science, and if anybody can get in there uh, in London, I mean, it is in a certain sense extolling the role of Britain in the enlightenment and the creation of modernity, so it is nationalistic, but it is one that is trying to uh, uh, get over the idea of the uh, ripping off the Parthenon, for example, and saying that there was a global enlightenment uh, of which uh, the British Museum was participatory in rather than dominant in. And this is an interesting uh, thing that's going on museum. So there's three things that are uh, uh, points of information, I guess, that you might want to have a gander at. Especially the archive.org. I know that everybody knows about that if you're even uh, half witted in. Um, scholarship now you realize there's a lot of stuff on that but if you actually see what they're doing with respect to the digital recording of the, of the complete net going back to the beginning of that is really quite astonishing. And well what's interesting about that if I could just comment quickly the um, that's open. So when I was talking to Marshall um, about open data what came up in the discussion part of the motivation are things that aren't open. 
So there's, it's like Star Wars. There's like the evil empire, and there's some dark forces amassing against open data. We're going to open this right now, and one of them is predatory publishing. And the scientists are very worried about this, and especially in, in countries like this, often you have predatory publishing is thriving. Um, and someone's sitting there doing biochemistry well, research, and they're saying, oh, okay, only three people really care about this receptor I'm working on, da da da. Um, but I need this on my CV, so I'm going to publish with this, this journal, which looks legit. But those journals are just like on the bottom of the ocean, just vacuuming up data. And it's to them, they don't even care what the data is, but they're owning that data. You know, like that exoplanet digital object, like I said, it's a constellation of proprietary data. data. But right now, the big publishers own most of it. But the predatory publishers, <laughs> and, and, and there, there you have something really interesting going on, and that's why the digital provenance is so important, and that's why there's so many big dark data realms out there already, and that will never be recovered. Um, and so it's quite amazing. But one other thing I want to say about digital, um, I there's a lot of enthusiasm about it, and I want to make uh, a, a passionate case for actual exhibits and real artifacts. We're going to be doing that tomorrow. I'm going to talk about that briefly if I have five minutes. Um, but but now why the, with the exhibit, like real exhibits, real things, it's kind of like a platitude in the museum world. Oh, you got to experience the real thing. But actually, in the commercial realm, they already buy this. So if you go to, at least in Western countries, these big commercial districts where they have all these fancy stores, those stores are curated and they are retail museums because everything, all their money's coming from online sales right now. But people want to walk in the stores and see these beautifully um, curated spaces. They don't buy anything in them. They're like museums for a commercial enterprise, right? So a lot of, a lot of retailers now, major multi-international retailers are, 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 are now basically curating at the street level. So, so we in the museum world, before we go too far on the digital, have to realize that people do like the real thing. So we have to keep curating in, in real time too, and not just curating. Um, but curating, as I've learned in the digital realm, creates really different possibilities. So you're not curating in space and time and the sensory, but you're curating in sequences, um, and, and procedures, and, 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 it's a, and it's almost like a mathematical kind of thing creates new unexpected possibilities um, when you juxtapose certain objects and stuff. And so, so that is kind of, I would say there's some hype there that's kind of interesting. Um, now we're coming to a close tonight. Can I introduce tomorrow? Yeah. Um, would, people, would people mind if I just want to introduce what we're doing tomorrow? Um, and then we'll give a nice break and then Anna can speak. Um, but tomorrow we're going to the Anatomy Museum here, Anatomy and Pathology Museum. Um, I just want to first of all warn you, I went yesterday, it is graphic, and I was saying to my wife on FaceTime, <laughs> I, it got under my skin a bit, some of the bodies and stuff, and I, I see a lot of, um, you know, anatomy here and there, I go to medical museums, but, but you know, just to warn you, if, if you have an issue with that, to know that there's a lot of things, cancer and deformed babies and all, and there's like a guy who died a year ago right in the lobby there, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, uh, but I just want to introduce like, kind of what we're doing tomorrow and, and, and how this relates to, um, uh, we're, we've been talking all week and we're experiencing the real tomorrow, okay? So I'm really looking forward to this and, and really you guys, it's a platform for you. I'm going to be dividing you into groups and I'm, I'm going to have a few questions for the groups and then we're going to have presentations afterward, not formal presentations, but, but you know, what are your responses to the, to the specimen the area I'm going to put you in? And I'm so really excited about, you know, seeing, um, we've been filled with all this stuff this week, and, and, and how are you going to respond to a real space? Um, I don't work with specimens too often, um, uh, but, but so this is, this is going to be really interesting. Um, but I want to introduce you to where, where this comes from. Um, one thing, and, and this is kind of in the theme of the disruptive museum. You can see I'm kind of, uh, I fancy myself a disruptive curator, and that is uh, not reinforcing, but learning new things, creating new um, experiences. And one of the things um, that we did, and this was a big thanks to Gordon and his group, is they seeded the first 
um, workshop that we did a summer school like this uh, in 2009. Roland was one of the faculty, and we had some really neat faculty come in from around the world, and students from across Canada from many different disciplines, architecture, literature, science, art, um, art history, science history, architecture. And we, we had a kind of, like a similar group to this, 20 people. We engaged the, a small group of our collection from many perspectives. And that became a yearly thing, and now it's, we've, I've done it in China, this is in the Palace Museum. Um, we did a version of it in um, Copenhagen um, with colleagues there at the Medical Museum. Um, and then we do little miniature ones across the country and, and, and in our museum for classes. And I do, and this is based on a seminar that, that I do at the university. Um, and Rich Kramer at Dartmouth College um, was really one of the foundational people here, including Roland. Um, but, but what's at the basis of it, and this is kind of what we're doing tomorrow in a sense, and many people do this in collections. Um, Mira has helped me already with how we're going to respond to tomorrow with, she's done this with her class with, um, with the uh, collection. But um, it's kind of at the, at the base of it is something you know, you're concerned about the museum, but here's a big dinosaur I work in, and how can we kind of reinvent the space? You know, when I got to the museum, it was like, it was very, like many museums, problematic to access the stuff for teaching, for research, for doing that creative activities. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the approach and what we can learn from objects. Um, so really it's about when you have, there's two elements to it. Diverse objects and diverse people. And when you bring the two together, you create alternative perspectives uh, on, on and dimensions, alternative historical dimensions within the within the collection. You see things that you don't see in the artifacts, um, and it creates a critical awareness for the material world uh, and this kind of disruptive narratives. And I, and I think um, some people say, well, why does it work so well when we do it in, in our museum? Um, and it's nothing to do with, um, say, my teaching ability. It's just diverse people, diverse objects. You bring them together few questions like we'll do tomorrow and interesting things happen. And the reason why it shouldn't be surprising, but it is surprising because the museum world has been so narrowly focused for so long and, and we're working within certain connoisseur type channels that when you bring multiple perspectives, it's like shocking. Oh, I can see an object from so many different dimensions. Well, uh, I think we'll be doing that a bit tomorrow. Um, so uh, just some of the questions, um, you know, even like, People are very uncomfortable with objects. They're like, uh, they, they, they're very, yeah, everyone can critically read between the lines about Modi and the Hindu times and about his, why he said that and why his minister said that, but they can't do it for an object. You go to get an x-ray at, at the dentist and, and you can't critically analyze that object. Where was it made? What, what are the, why, why does it look like that? Why is it this color? And, you know, what does it remind you of? Well, we should be able to critically examine the things of the world in the same way we can critically examine a, 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 new, a newspaper article about Moby, right? Um, so um, I'm not going to go, I'm just going to just show you quickly, but there's a, in a big, and anyone can write to me about this if you want to do this with your, um, with your students or, or with your colleagues, but I just kind of have a cheat sheet of basic questions that take you into these alternative dimensions. What is it made of? Well, that seems like a trivial question, but well, the material, if it's a scientific instrument with ivory from 1880, well, that brings in a lot of ethical issues about where that ivory came from. Um, if it has copper now, well, that brings in issues about the whole non-ferrous metal trade around the world and how this is a this is an environmental story. So these are trivial questions, but they're 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 quite important. Um, and when we get into questions like um, kind of uh, aesthetics, and I'll ask you this tomorrow. Okay, specimens. Well, there's an aesthetic in there. There's choices that are made between between um, pure function, what is functional, and what is decorative, and where those choices are made. That's what culture is. What other objects does it resemble from the same time period? So tomorrow, uh, we're helping with this. I'm just going to give you a few. You can write some of these down, but. Um, uh, what is anatomy? So I want you thinking about these types of questions tomorrow. That's a, you know, you're going in there with that, not to take it for granted. That's the best thing about what, what we have to do in science museums. We have to 
step back from what we're doing and ask those types of questions. And Mira has, has given me a lot of these great ones here. Why is this museum even here? Um, the function of the museum as an artifact, um, the bias in the displays, I love that question. Going around thinking of the bias, biases. Uh, are, oh, I love these emotional questions. I like a lot. Sometimes you ask this question, curiosity, what, what are you curious about? What disgusts you? What interests you? I sometimes just like ask students, do you like it and why? Do you not like it? Um, oh, questions about how the specimens were prepared. The guy tomorrow who actually does the preparation and the painting and, and what we call the interpretation or the artist of the specimens is going to be there. But see, these are questions that you don't get in texts. When you read about the history of anatomy, you often don't read about it. This takes you into the labor history and the material history, and that's where objects do. They take you into these interesting realms. Um, what does not belong, what doesn't belong, that's great. Um, uh, oh, let, I want to encourage, if anyone's an artist tomorrow, to draw. You don't have to speak. What's your sensory experience tomorrow? But do some drawings. I've, I've worked with a really interesting artist in Copenhagen, Lucy Lyons, who, who, who expresses herself and gets students to draw. Um, they even like poetry. Pardon? They even respond to poetry. Poetry is one of the most underused resources in museums. <laughs> so I encourage you guys to be free tomorrow. Um, here's, and then, I mean, I'm going to think about some thematic questions to ask the groups tomorrow, but you know, I think cancer is a good one. That's like a, it's a, it's a, uh, there's anomalies. People were talking about anomalies today. Um, women, there's like something going on there about women. Um, Models, um, not uh, models, fashion models, but models. There's a, now, it's interesting, the guy told me yesterday that, that, oh, we don't have any models, and there are tons of models, and they're like right back to the history of the museum. There's these wooden models with this beautiful decoration. Um, some of the techniques, oh, Gordon, you know, we've got, let's, seeing through a specimen. Um, not seeing through a microscope, seeing through a specimen, that kind of idea. Um, and then object possibilities, um, what do we not see? Um, but to, oh, and I want you maybe to think tomorrow about um, how you would exhibit these things. So, you know, this is a pretty traditional anatomical, um, you know, a museum and display organization. How would you do it? Um, and that's, uh, that's where I want you really thinking creatively out of the box. And then, of course, this is, an anatomist would say, this is the same as any anatomy museum around the world. Well, there is, I've seen a lot of them. This is a very local one with, um, with interesting things going on. So um, anyway, I just want you, I'm really excited about tomorrow. I just want to introduce what we're going to be doing. But you're going to be in groups. So if you're scared of groups, you know, just come and draw or something or do poetry in this corner. So thanks. OK, we'll break it. Is there any questions? Any, uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah. So uh, one of the questions that did have to me was, you know, when you, when you see yourself as a digital curator, and there's, there's so much also in the corporate world, like in engineering firms or yeah. uh, just firms, let's say, who produce plastic films, oh, thanks, or firms who produce plastic films or, or, or any scientific objects. They are actually now hiring digital archivists. Yes. So what would you say is the difference between a digital archivist and a digital curator then? You know? um, ooh, I, I, okay, I won't really answer that, but I will say that this is an exciting time to do this type of work because a lot of people in the industry are hiring people to organize their archives, their things. Uh, it will be a lot of fun. Right. So, uh, it is an exciting time, but at the same time, you know, it also brings the question of where in academia are these uh, repositories or uh, strengths placed, right? You know, because a lot of people will look for, you know, people from the library and information sciences as well, you know, when they're looking at digital archives. So where does one, you know? So I'm just. Uh, I'm just curious as to see, you know, if you're a museum versus the, the corporate world, and how does one, how is one hiring? Oh, okay. Even though it's an exciting time. Uh, um, well, yeah, I think I, I can answer. Okay. I think, so uh, if, if you read the paper which I put in of Soraya, she's actually arguing that the digital work brings actually the world of curatorship and archiving closer together. But you also have to argue whether that in the past has been a good divide. Because a lot of times we have to bring the archives, and Soraya actually makes some, some points about that, that uh, the
this kind of divide between paper archives and museums is also a lot of times an artificial one and a troubling one for us as historians because these parts have been ripped apart and bringing these two things together is actually a good thing. But I think you also bring up another division like, like corporate archives, corporate museums. So we have a whole structure, a whole layer. We're talking here about national museums, but we have a whole layer of museums, archives, which are also very problematic because they all come with their own again. Right? It is, for example, if you take Big Pharma. <laughs> yeah. So for example, if you talk about Big Pharma, they have atrocious kind of money. Like, like a lot of good money is in Big Pharma. And then you know what happens to archiving or even curating? You know, how artificial does it become? Well, we're lucky in Canada. We have um, one of our biggest pharmacology companies has invested a lot over the last two decades in archiving their stuff. Um, Chris Ruddy and Sonoma Pastor. Um, and, uh, and so they've, um, but that's because it's of national significance. It's the uh, Banting Vast Insulin story. Um, so, but he's been, he's a historian of medicine who's been hired there for years, but archive versus museums, 15 years ago, you would not have gone even near a job posting in a library. Now libraries and information studies are the place, they're doing the best stuff, and that the best place to work in the cultural sector, you know, museums are, are still diminishing returns and, and we're always going to get kicked around and not have but but museum but it's part it's information where, where all the the BI school in Toronto, in fact the museum studies program had to go into that um, department. But so it's um, that's the that's the that's where they're dealing with intellectual property digitization. Uh, it's really neat neat stuff. Um, so so they're taking they're they're really just taking the lead. It's good to know. Okay. Uh, just just to come back to this one point about. The museum being a problematic institution. All institutions are political, all institutions are problematic. National museums are utterly political, but then we have to look at ourselves as our own institutions, as a university, right? Universities are very problematic institutions, right? I mean, they're hierarchy creating, there are a lot of political interests here. Uh, so, education as opening up spaces, but also education and discipline, right? So it's not that museums are any kind of different from no, other kinds of... We also need to acknowledge that they yeah, yeah, are yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, and not exactly. just a sanitized space. Yeah, yeah. And we also will know, even, even though we can make like, very nice pictures of the museum of the future, but also the future museum will have all these constraints. Because also museums are spaces within, within the real world. But that actually means even more so that we have to intervene, right? And that we have to go in and we have to talk about these issues. You know what I like about your question though is, um, and it relates to Sudar's uh, uh, question, and your question earlier too, um, is that, and this is why I'm kind of energized to be here, because we still in the West take museums for granted. Even though their funding is going and we're kind of, our attendance is dying off, and, but we're kind of, um, we're kind of like on the deck of the Titanic having tea and, and listening to piano music and, and what I like what I've heard here is there's a little bit of skepticism about museums and there's probably uh, if I could you know just make a wild kind of guess that it's something related to the British kind of civil you know the civilization model of museums that we don't really have in Canada because we kind of adopted it. But I can see this ambivalence and skepticism towards museums. That's why I answered your question about what curators can do, because I think there is something really exciting about being a curator in this type of environment. That's why I really like, I'm kind of energized about the discussions here this week, and, 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 and I do believe what I said the other day, that there are vast, vast, profitable collections of knowledge across this country that are ripe for these types of interventions on your own terms in radical, creative, flexible, dynamic ways, and, and so that you don't need museums for. But as a curator, are you uncomfortable about certain sorts of narratives? Uh, I'm not or certain sorts of objects that you would not be very comfortable displaying? Like what? That's for your answer. Um, no, I, 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 no, I don't think so. Um, but maybe... There, there, because there, are, there always are messy objects. Yeah. Even digital in the digital age. 
the, the classic one is the Nola Gay uh, exhibit at the Smithsonian, and people might not know a bit about that uh, here, where, you know, the bomber that, yeah. um, and that was an extreme political object, right? And, yeah, because they entangle, yeah. all objects are entangled in various ways, and they are not always comfortable working with. So. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example because I, I know that I know recently I even um, even in discussions with colleagues, you know, I do censor things sometimes, just my own personal bias or something like, uh, and then I'm in concerns from a national, like from a political. You know, like, uh, like for example, here, here's a good example. Um, abortion is yeah. a big issue. Yeah. Um, oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah, um, so, so, for example, um, abortion is a big issue, uh, especially in the United States, but it's a big issue in Canada. And uh, I was there's a there's an archive in Ottawa that has um, a lot of things related to abortion, including the things from the first abortion clinic, um, Henry Morgenthaler, is things from his clinic um, in, in there. And one of them is the plaque on his door. So this is a major thing in the news decades ago, um, and very controversial, still very controversial, what his role was as an abortion doctor. But on this, it's his, it's his brass nameplate on his door, and it says um, something, um, you know, fucking baby killer, or you know, something very, very harsh. Uh, when I was in the archive and I discovered it, I tweeted about it. Literally in brackets, I put what what was. Now that's a lot for a national curator with a conservative government uh, with ties to <laughs> anti-abortion to tweet. But I thought I covered myself. I put it in the polls. Um, when when he died, again I retweeted that. And I did get nervous uh, on, a, on a political level. So I, I took it down a week later or something, just if someone's going through, um, you know, I wanted it out there that those, for those few days, but then I took it down. I just thought, I, you know, I don't want to be in the news because then that would take away from my own kind of things that I care about at the museum. Um, and then I didn't want to be a sacrificial lamb for a big issue. So I would like that to be on display. Can I answer your question? But I myself um, was worried and took that down from my very public. Twitter's more public than the museum. You guys can read my Twitter account if you want. And that's uh, what's that? I put this sign up there. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty. Oh, yeah, it's a fucking baby killer or something. Yeah. It's not a question, but I think I wanted to go back to the issue of like, uh, institutions. In a way, one thing that I have been speaking to is that the museums and institutions itself is changing. So I think it's very important to bring up a little bit more, throw out a little bit more that kind of idea because in a way when you were talking about engineering and populations getting more involved because when we were talking about British Empire times, you have a, the museum as a certain kind of institution that plays a particular role. So the, the relationality of objects to the institution are very specific to that kind of um, project or production of a certain subject. In a way. So now I think there, I mean, the stuff you were presenting for me were raising that, that there is a change of the institution and a change of how we imagine and articulate the subject of a particular moment that we find ourselves in. So I don't know, I think in a way this raises also other sites are, tr are contesting exactly the space. They want to use their own spaces to make and articulate the subject. So I think. We do have to speak to that tension as well, you know. So it's not just about what we are doing, and you know that there is. I mean, what you are doing is great, actually. I love the things that you are articulating, but also at the same time raising the question of how do we really contest it in a public way? Yeah. You know, because that's the question. I mean, why are we doing this kind of work even ourselves? You know. Do you think museums are changing? No, I actually don't I think, think they are. I think they are. Yes. I, I, don't, I don't think museums are changing. That's again why I go to the yeah. curatorial level. I think maybe we are. Um, but but I, actually they're, being, they're, they're getting more conservative in some ways. I have colleagues that do not tweet as freely as I do. Um, I mean, but I don't want to speak to being conservative. 
conservative or um, yeah, okay. liberal. I'm speaking as an, I'm, I don't want to do that as good or bad. I'm not in anything that is a kind of not a productive way of thinking about what we're trying to do. But looking at it as an institution, what is it that it, it assembles together? You know, uh, things that it, it was, I mean, before, for instance, if we take for boss here to sleep, we were talking about the management of the subject. So the institution became, I mean, the museum was that, I mean, you wanted to take all the ideas of Aboriginal people, Indians, whatever, secrets, and put them there so that you can fetishize them and thereby render them agentless. You know, so in a way now the institution is doing something different. I don't have the answer. I mean, this is this is empirical yeah. work. You know, and you are doing part of that. But I think I see it as a changing space in the logical political oh, frame. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I, agree. I don't want to say it's good or bad or it's conservative or liberal. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I and, but it's not. It's, I, what I'm saying is, it's not us. It's actually people that are changing it. It's the world around these things that are forcing us to change. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great about the digital. It, it's a, it's a, it's, it's allowing people to, to use a fashion for to hack the digital, which is one dimension. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mira. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my last answer was a question brought up using sport, right? Yeah. And I feel that uh, there are themed museums as well. I've been, I'm a great museum hopper. I go to museums everywhere. It's kind of fun. I like it. But the point is that. Maybe museums are also disruptive. Maybe they're not supposed to inform and educate, but maybe they're supposed to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, maybe these narratives, uh, sometimes uh, I think it's more than, uh, when we do museum, uh, like I'm, because of, as a wildlife biologist before I became a philosopher, uh, every time they would go and they would show us, this is the species that was lived in blah blah, and this is the exact skin preserved species of whatever was lost forever. I'm like, if that's going to be lost forever, what were you doing killing that and stuffing it and putting it in a museum? So it brings about ethical concept. I think that lies within the observer. And to treat the museums as objects without the subject who's encountering these objects, I think that I think that if people were taught to encounter objects and the alternative narratives can be generated, it's the same exhibit that was once colonial can also be seen as a post-colonial object saying, this is what they did, look. Yeah. And so it becomes, I think it's about the narrative that you build up. And uh, what I would also like to say is in sometimes, uh, like I've seen the Everyday Object Museum, which is very, very interesting, which is a large extent popular in a lot of places in India. Um, I don't know if you know about it, but there's uh, Rustam Barucho who set up a Jhalu Museum on the broom in Rajasthan. Uh, there are lots of museums with puppet, puppets and dolls, of course that's cultural, but here there is an object called the Indian broom, which is set up an entire array of different kinds of brooms, um, and where they are from, their narrative, their prominence, everything. So there are interesting possibilities uh, that can be done, but because we model ourselves, I think that's the problem. We model ourselves on certain, in all epistemes, on a certain kind of epistemic, uh, we end up doing the same thing that the colonials did. Not only are we colonial, they did it to us, we are colonial in our minds. So I think unless we get out of that and disrupt this, maybe as you said, art and science coming together is a kind of disruption or a rupture, if you want to call it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I like the discomfort, the experience, as opposed to the education mission. Um, uh, and I'll give you a good example. One of the things I'm in charge of is horology time. And we haven't done a really good time exhibit in a while, and it's like it would be amazing to do one. Um, but the best time exhibit in the city of Ottawa was at the National Art Gallery, and it's, some of you may have heard about this, but this fantastic 24-hour film by Christian Marclay, um, with, where he, where it's all, he, he went sifted four years and with with assistance through all the history of film and pulled out all these sequences, three second sequences with a clock in it. So it's 24 hours, so at 11.01, he has a Woody Allen film with the clock shown 11.01. At 11.02, at he has Burt Reynolds hitting an alarm at 11.02, waking up, and so the whole history of film went through. So it is the best, it's the best dealing of time in a museum setting. 
And it's embarrassing because science museums don't ever do something like that, but the contemporary art gallery had, I, tell, I said to my students, if you like science museum stuff, go to the time. You know, that's an experience, and it was a profound experience of time, and we in the science museum, no science museum in the world has ever done an exhibit like that, a great exhibit. I rest my case.